Hello guys and welcome back to the Privet Park podcast. Today we've got another belter episode for you as today I'm joined by another Gosport legend. Well this man's not just a Gosport legend, he's just a non-league legend. He's tearing it up in the National League at the moment with Boreham Wood and I'm sure you guys know who I'm talking about because you guys have been asking him to come on for months because I'm joined by none other than Nathan Ashmore. Nathan, how are you doing today mate? I'm good, thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, looking forward to it. Well, a lot of fans have been asking for you to come on, so it's going to be a belter this episode. I can just feel it already. But let's start <laughs> and just dive straight into it, shall we? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But can you just start, really? How did you actually get into football? Because I think you actually started with a local Pompey team. So can you just tell me your early football memories and how you got into the game? Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, obviously, like all young kids playing at the park and stuff and um mum taking me to various football training sessions uh, like local community and stuff um played for the school um and then played with like a local my age group for on a sunday team uh, then managed to play for portsmouth for my young for my age uh was there for a few years didn't quite work out um and then i played at 15, I played for a team called United Services, which is based in Gosport, uh, based in uh, Gunwharf, sorry. Um, it's the Navy base. Uh, so I played there for a couple of years at the age of 15, 16, um, I think 17 as well. And yeah, that was pretty much the start of my, my early career and then went from there to, to have and that was joined with the college that I was at. Oh, so is this kind of like college football? So I think they've still got a course linked with Haven and Waterloo. Where yes. If you go to yeah. South Downs. So That's is all. it that one? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Like, I think it was the first. I think I was. I didn't actually um, do the academy course as such, um, but I played for I played for the academy for that that string of football. Um, I think I think my year was the first year that joined up with Haven. So I think if I think I was the only one from that year got a contract I think there was a couple of us that were training um with them and then I think uh Craig Robson he went on to Bogner and then obviously went Bogner to Dagenham and Barnet and so so forth um but yeah, so there was a few of us we had a good we had a good year we had a good uh, select group there um so and I managed to to get a contract with with Havnall Laville through that so you mentioned a contract there and I was reading a bit about like non-league football at the time and how like actually wages worked and stuff. But with United Services, I think at the moment players do get paid, but I don't think that was a thing back then because then players used to have to pay for the team. So I'm guessing this was quite a contrast to actually getting a contract with Haven't where you were being paid as a player. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I <laughs> I remember playing for United Services um and obviously, I, I was 15, 16, 17 at the time, and we had to, we still had to pay subs on a Saturday, which was five pound. Um, half the time, I, I I didn't have to pay it, but uh, because <laughs> I had no income, so I was supposed <laughs> to pay it. So I kind of got let off every now and then. So that was that was quite funny. Um, but yeah, for sure, I was when I think I signed at um, Haven when I was 18, 19, I think. And I was I was getting fifty pound a week from them. That was my first contract. Oh, wow, well, wow, fifteen pounds a week. Well, to be fair, looking back now, that's not really much, was it? No, no, it's not, mate. No, not a lot at all. I think I've got like two like two hundred pound a month, and I think like, a little bit of that was still paying tax. <laughs> Oh no, no. Oh, imagine you were playing in today's society. It'd probably be triple that with the amount youngsters get paid now. Yeah, crazy, mate. Yeah, crazy. No, but I was reading a bit about into it, how you actually kind of got into the academy at United Services. And weirdly enough, I think I read somewhere that you actually trialed as a right wing. So how did that I actually did. come along? Yeah, yeah, I did. Because I, I, when I got released from Portsmouth, uh, I stopped playing football um, completely. Uh, just, yeah, oh, I, well. Yeah, I stopped, yeah, I completely stopped. I, I just played like at the park and stuff. So I didn't play for any teams as, as such. Uh, when I mean stopped at all, well, I literally just played played at the park with, with my cousins or a couple of mates, whatever. Um, and then I, I come back from um, the summer and I wanted to, to join up a team again. So I, I just thought I'd just go down to United Services and go back playing in goal. But the season before that, I was literally playing right wing. I played for the reserves as a as a right right midfielder. I went to training to play <laughs> player because 
I just felt like just yeah, I just didn't want to be in goal anymore. Uh, and then decided that I I wanted to be in goal again. So then I went back as uh, a goalie, went, played for the reserve team for United Services, and then um, I think we played a cup game. I think the reserves team played a cup game against Wimborne Town. And it was on the pitch, and I played really well that game. So that's when I started to be like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm really liking this now." And then played in another game, and Bob Brady was there, who was the manager at the time, who, who's obviously a club legend. Uh, um, decided like, "Oh, you can come along and, and play, play for the first team." So I played for the first team. I was at college at the time. And yeah, I was, I was 16 and played against Andover New Street, I think. Oh, we, wow. Yeah. Who, I think, who I think, yeah. <laughs> wow, yeah, because you mentioned you were 16 at the time. So it, I'm not sure if I'm right here, but were you playing men's football at men's, like a, age 16 then? I was, mate, right, yeah. Yeah, wow. yeah, so I was playing men's football at 16, yeah. So how did you find that, getting into men's football at such a young age? Because I'm obviously uh, 16 at the moment, and sometimes I, I find it quite hard. Yeah, for sure. Like to be honest, mate, I, I I didn't really see any difference. Like I was used to playing with men anyway. Like, um, because oh, I was quite big for my age at the time. Um, yeah, I, I didn't really see nothing. I didn't didn't really see anything different in it. So, for me, it was just I just got on with it. I was playing, and that was it. So, did you always find you were just kind of suitable with this level, and this kind of helped adapted you for when you did join the bigger teams like having a more to leave or because you did already have that men's experience already. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I, I would say I adapted in such as being around uh, men um, at that at that time. Um, but then I soon learned that it's not all about just being at that age and and being around men. It was when I signed for having it was more of a case of how an actual football team works when it's dealing with good money and money as like it's pretty much the main income in, in someone's household. So it that was a hard transition to um to come from playing in men's football and then going again to playing in men's football at a decent standard that players get paid like five to eight, nine hundred pound a week and I was only getting fifty pound a week. So I found out a bit of a struggle at a young age, but I soon got to grips of it and got on with it. Well, you mentioned about how you actually struggled with the transition there. And is that because when you were playing with United Services, it sounded as if so you were more playing just for the fun of it, as for the hobby. Whereas when you joined Haven't, you were getting something out of it, you were getting money. So when you did make that transition as well, did you feel as though you can actually kind of make a life out of it? So maybe, I don't know, make it as pro when you're older. This could, was kind of your first step into that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, like obviously when you... When you're young kids, it's it's every boy's dream to play professional football and play in the Premier League and play for your country. I think every little kid has that dream of of becoming that footballer. But then obviously little steps get you closer. And obviously that was one little step that was getting me closer to being a, a, a full time or professional footballer. Um, and when when you're when you're dealing with players that get paid good money, that that had a, a good career because normally players that tend to play for like your Havants and um, Gosport and Bogner and um, teams like similar to this, like you, you, you kind of get players that are on the downward spiral that played in League One, played in, in the champ, played in League Two, and they're coming down at the end of their career, so they're a little bit older. So it was, it was hard to um, transition of how a football club worked properly behind the scenes with other players and, and big personalities and... and um, players getting paid good wages when they're not playing and stuff so yeah that that was it was interesting to go through and obviously I had to learn a lot very quickly um but yeah it, yeah, it was all good fun it was yeah it was great and at the time as well you mentioned how you were kind of looking to maybe make this as a professional when you were older so it was this kind of your full priority like did you have any plans at the time for other jobs or was it actually just solely football at the time no, so uh, when I was when I was um, playing for Haven, uh, I was still at college at the time for for a season, and then um, left college, and then got work straight straight after as soon as I finished college. But then I was still playing for Haven, so I had two. So I had basically technically two jobs. So I was playing football and getting paid for it, and then I had a job on the side as well. So it was kind of 
I wanted to play football full time. I didn't really want to work elsewhere. So that was the next step. OK, yeah, that actually makes quite a bit of sense, because I think quite a few young players have to do this. They have to juggle quite a bit. So I was watching a recent documentary. I think it was about some of the people who came out of academies and had to get jobs, like prepare for the outside. And a lot of them do go in non-league just to try and reconjure up the leagues and stuff. But did you ever find it hard trying to maintain a work-life balance with football and working a job at the same time? Uh, I think I think when you when you're that young, uh, I would I, well for me personally, I would say no. The only thing that you struggle with is why am I not playing higher? And um, I want to play higher. What can I do to play higher? But I just kind of feel like it's it's kind of what you have to do, mate. Like things have to get paid, so you don't really want to be sitting around and pretending and wishing and hoping because that's not going to work. So you kind of have to do things to to make make things happen. Yeah, exactly that, exactly that. But I think one of the biggest <coughs> struggles for you was not getting the game time at having a more to level because I think you had quite a big feud with the manager at the time about it involving a number one jersey. So can you just tell me a bit about that and the feud that happened occurring you and the manager? Yeah, for sure. Like, obviously, uh, I went there uh, as as a young kid, uh, 18, 19 at the time. So I knew I wasn't wasn't going to be playing Every game, uh, they had an established keeper. They literally not long gone on from that FA Cup run that they had. They played Liverpool, uh, so I didn't. I didn't really expect to play. Obviously, I played in a few cup games and a few um, pre-season friendlies and stuff, which was good and a good learning curve in that. Um, but yeah, so the first season it, it is what it is. Um, I think I, I think I played. A couple of games. I think the keeper at the time got sent off towards the end of the season. I think I, I think I managed to play. Oh, I can't remember. Maybe six games. I think, um, and then that keeper left. And in the following season, then it was like a joint number one. Um, then I then I didn't play that season. And the same thing happened. I think he got sent off again. And I think I I think I managed to play another six games. Um, and then the following year after that, that keeper left. Um, and then I was the number one going into that season, and I felt I felt like I didn't have a fair um, crack at playing as number one. I think I played four games, I think that season, and then went out on went out on loan not long after that. Yeah, because I think it was the game against Salisbury that was kind of the final nail in the coffin by the looks of it. Because diving into the archives, I think Salisbury, where you lost 4-0 to Salisbury, I think it was, it looked as though that was your final game. And then after that, there was really no recollection of you having a more to leave all. Yeah, so was much. this your final game? Yeah, it was. Yeah, I remember the game. I remember the game, to be fair, like it was yesterday. Uh, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a great day in the office for me, but... At the time, uh, Salisbury were a joke at the time. They had some really, really good players. Uh, obviously, they had a big fan base and stuff. And, um, and yeah, we got battered 4-0 um, quite early on in the season. So, I felt like I was an easy scapegoat because of my, like, because of my age. Um, that's what I mean. I, don't, I felt like I didn't really get a fair crack at it. <clears throat> but I'm not the manager at the end of the day. I'm just a player. I don't make the decisions. And I, as a player, I felt like I um, didn't get a fair chance. But um, that was my last game. I stayed there for a few more weeks. I think I can't remember exactly how long. Uh, kind of went to the manager and, and said that like, I would like to play. Um, why, have I, like, why have I been dropped? And like the usual stuff that you, you, you talk about to your manager when a player gets dropped. Uh, might have gone about it the wrong way at the time, but... You're young, you think you know everything. So um, it was my decision. Like it was obviously mine and and uh, the, the manager's decision at the time to for me to go out on loan. And I and I obviously asked like if I'm not playing here, I want to I want to go out on loan. And I think that week, I think two teams come in for me, Bashley for a month for Gospel on loan for the whole season. So I obviously it was an easy choice. I, I just wanted to play, so I, I decided to go to Gospel for a whole season. At least I knew I was going to get game time for a whole season.
Well, looking back at it now, it must have been a brilliant decision looking back. Not only did it make brilliant gospel memories, but also I'm guessing it kind of helped you as well grow as a goalkeeper because you were starting to get a lot more game time and you were kind of building a project along gospel. You were kind of leading up to their golden years almost. So was there anything that actually drew you to gospel? Because I've read a couple of articles and I was even speaking to Justin Bennett and he said the major reason was Alex Pike. So was he actually kind of influential to you joining gospel? Yeah, for sure. I think I think there was a combination of a few things because I, when I said uh, I mentioned about me joining Haven um, Waterlooville, um, Alex Pike actually wanted me to go to Gosport at that age, and he actually offered me a contract, and I, I turned it down because I'm um, I want I wanted to go to college, and then I wanted to uh, play for Haven Waterlooville at the time as well. Because I remember when uh, I was at United Services, we actually played gospel in a cup game and we beat them in a Hampshire Senior Cup oh, and I wow. played really well. And then Alex Pike has had me on my ra- like had me on his radar ever since then, really. So um, so I knew, obviously, speaking to him in the past, and I knew that he was um, fond of me as a player. So that, that, that was easy enough. And then the main decision was game time, mate. I just wanted to play play football and I knew I was going to go there for a whole season and play and I knew um, quite a few players at the, at the club already so it was an easy decision for me. Well I was speaking to quite a few players especially goalkeepers as well and they say they really need a good manager to like kind of help them build it but and by the sounds of it your relationship between you and yourself and the Havant manager wasn't that great but having this great connection with Alex it must have really helped with your experience and this must have actually outputted with better performances on the pitch as well. Yeah, for sure. Like it's it's, it's just it's just uh, man management uh, with certain players. Um, every manager goes about it differently, and I didn't didn't really particularly get on with the well with the having a Ville manager, um, and I did with the Gosford manager, and it it was a good partnership. And we yeah we had so I had some great memories, some great times there, and I knew I was wanted, loved pretty much from from the word go and obviously performances showed that yeah well they definitely put, showed it because I was reading somewhere that after your initial loan you were actually contacted by Pompey and you did a trial with Pompey so can you tell me a bit about that because I think this was when they were actually in the Premier League as well um yes yeah, so I, I I went back I went back there training for a little bit when um I was at college this was where this was before Haven, I think. This was when I was playing for United Services, and then um, went back training again when I was at Gosport. When I think Portsmouth might have been in the Championship. No, they were in uh, League Two. Sorry, they, I went oh, okay. back. Yeah, well, there was League Two because Alan Knight was the manager, and I went back training there and. Um, What's his? Uh, I can't remember who was the manager. Guy Whitman was the manager. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, he yeah. Just, so I went training for. I went training for a few years. It was one of those ones. It was, uh, it was good. It was good, but there was no way. That there was never going to offer me anything. Um, so I kind of knew that they weren't really going to offer me anything. That Portsmouth are in League Two, under pressure. They're not going to stick in a to them a nobody goalie in, in, in League Two in such a big big club like Portsmouth in League Two so it, obviously it didn't work out so and I was still contracted at Gosport so I was just, that's, that's pretty much at the end of that Well I think even though you didn't get your move to Pompey and nothing really came of it, make, same with Gosport was probably the right move in the end because I think it was 2011 your first season and you actually had quite a good story with that season as well because I'm pretty sure they got to the playoff final as well so can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah for sure yeah it was um, yeah it was good mate to be honest I don't really remember much throughout the whole season it was that long ago but I, I, I'll never forget the day of uh, the playoff final mate it was it was pretty extraordinary, to be honest. We played Paul, we played Paul Town. Uh, I think we were one nil down in the first half, and then I think we. I remember going up for a corner with like a couple of seconds, like about a couple of minutes to go, and the ball got turned over to them, and they should have gone for goal, but they didn't. They, they just played around with the ball, and I think they tried to go to the corner flag, and then they lost the ball, and then we went up the other end and scored to make it one all, and then we end up winning in extra, in extra time, which was unbelievable, really, to be honest. 
Well, I was speaking to Justin Bennett a bit about it because I think it was Steve Claridge with the last minute goal as well. I <laughs> yeah, don't think was, yeah. they weren't playing that well to start with. So how did that come up? It must have been a bit of a shock seeing him get in the back of the net from goal. <laughs> Yeah, I know, mate. Yeah, it was. Uh, to be honest, I didn't really care who scored. To be honest, mate, like, I, I was so thankful that we equalised and we won. I scored another goal, and then Justin scored the third goal. I, I yeah, I didn't really care who scored, as long as we won the game. Mate. Yeah, it was pretty extraordinary. Well, Justin was telling me about the parties going on that night. It yeah, it was great yeah. to be there. But yeah, mate... it was a big carnage, mate. I tell you that now, it was pretty good. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> it was pretty good. Well, to be fair, the parties sound like they were amazing as well. But do you feel as though this was kind of Gosport's way of repaying you almost? Kind of your way of paying. You put your work in and kind of Gosport paid you back with a trophy. So it kind of worked quite nicely in the end for both parties. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I, I got the game time that I wanted. And and it, it just so happened that um, we went on into, to get promoted. Yeah, well, you didn't just get promoted once, did you? You got promoted again the second season. <laughs> yeah. And I think that one might have been even better because there was quite a good penalty shootout. If I I think I'm right, this is a penalty shootout one. Yeah, so you're going to have to tell me about this. Yeah, for sure. Like, yeah, it was, to be honest, mate, like, we we had a really, really bad, we had a really bad start. Um, yeah, really bad start. And I think we wouldn't, yeah, we didn't really do too well at the start. And then... Um, we end up going on a a I mad think, run. I think we went like twenty three twenty four ga- games or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah twenty three. Yeah, twenty four games unbeaten, and then we played our last game at home, and we had to win, and the results go away, and somehow they went our way. And I think <laughs> we got through by one goal, I think, and then we're like, oh my god, like we could win it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, because like you mentioned, that 24 unbeaten streak, how did that come along? Do you even remember what was said? Was there new signings or something? It just seems so out of the blue. Like said, it, it was so long ago, man. I don't remember. We, <laughs> we, we just had a, like a, a, a team. Um, we just literally just had a team, just took one game at a time. We had kind of like a party atmosphere. Um, we, all, we all knew each other off the pitch. Um, it was it was just all good fun and we all worked hard for each other and and it just clicked sometimes it just clicks mate and then that was one of the season it something something just clicked and then we went on one game and then another game and all we kept saying it was double bubble obviously because we would get win bonuses and lads would get gold gold bonuses clean sheet bonuses and we were just we were just like yeah lovely lovely little double bubble like this week going on to next week and stuff and then We'll have like a good, we we'll have like a good few beers on the coach on the way home from like long, long trips away. It was just all good fun, and training was always good fun. Um, and that's, and I think we expressed ourselves on the pitch, and, and we were very, very hard to beat. <laughs> Well, definitely. I think you were probably one of the best teams in the league at that point. Because looking back at the start, I was reading a couple of newspapers and looking at the predictions, they weren't great for that season as well. I think it was more the fact Gosport had quite an old squad at that time. So we had players like Brett Pope, for example, who were quite aging. Still a brilliant player, don't mind me yeah, saying. But, but yeah, I, a bit aging. Obviously, <laughs> slow as a snail, but he's <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely. Well, hopefully that'd be another podcast. But also... Just really, it was quite an old squad looking at it. So, was there really any expectations before the season had started? No, like, like we don't. I, we I don't think we had any expectations. I think we we literally just went into one game at a time. I can't I can't remember specifically like where we're going to go and start the season. We're going to try and win the league, or we're going to try and get the playoffs. I think obviously the gaffer at the time was like like we want to we want to reach the playoffs, whatever. But we didn't really think anything of it at the time, like. We, we, we just played. We just turned up and played. Obviously, you want to win every game. But there was no pressure on us whatsoever. Like, we, just pray, we, we just played freely. Um, and like I said, like we had an experience. We had an older squad, but it was full of experience. That Players that played in big games before, played at high level. And like I said, it just everything worked for us that season. And when we went on a run, like there was no stopping us. And then the only team that was going to win the playoffs was us, just because we got in the playoffs by one goal somehow. Well, exactly that. Sometimes it's all about luck, really, I find. But when you did get into the playoffs, you must have felt as though that was going to be your years. You already had the promotion from the playoffs of last season. So did you actually feel as though it was your year almost? Um, 
I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I can't remember, really remember. I, I felt I felt like we didn't want to get too carried away, but the the semi final of um, the playoffs when we played, I think it was Stourbridge. I think they're called. I think they're up Birmingham way. I, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they were really good. I, I, I think we played there up their place, and I think we lost. We drew. I think. I think we lost. But I think we got battered. Or we drew and we got battered. I can't remember the score. But and obviously we had to travel up there on a Tuesday night. Lags have obviously been working all day and stuff. Long coach trip. And we just thought, yeah, this could be a tough game today. And then I think we went one nil down and then we end up winning two one on the night. And I think that's when I think, well, we've got a chance. Like, like they're one of the best teams. I think they finished second as well. I can't remember where where they where they finished, but or third. Um, but we got loads and loads of confidence from winning that game, and then we t- obviously took it on into the final. Well, you couldn't have left it any later in the final, could you? Down to a penalty shootout. I was watching some of the videos from that game, and honestly, I don't know how you handled the pressure. Looking at the stadium, there was just so many fans. Like yeah, this must was, have been yeah. brilliant to play in front. Yeah, of, no, especially... yeah, it was really good. Yeah, it was good. I think it was about three thousand, maybe four thousand. Yeah, thousand. yeah. The... But what was good though, we like, like there was plenty of Gosport fans. It was really, really good behind that goal. It was, it did, it did make it like, like literally the cherry on top because um, obviously we're, we're just little old Gosport and stuff. So for so them, I think, I think, but we must have took five hundred fans, whatever, and it was absolutely brilliant. Um, and probably, probably seen one of the the best free kicks I've ever seen to date, ever in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, well I think that game was just the whole roller coaster of emotions, really, wasn't it? Because I was, like I said, I was watching some of the clips from that game, but I think it was a penalty shootout that really got me. Like I was just hearing you were shooting towards. I think everyone was shooting towards the Gosport fans, weren't yes. they? Yeah, yeah, we were. I don't, we, obviously, we must have won the toss in it, and it was, it was getting um, shooting from from into our fans, which obviously, which is a bonus. Um, but the penalty shootout is. It was it was mad because we had we had so many injuries that game as well. Like yeah. we had pretty much a disheveled team for the final, but there was still no stopping us. I think obviously we went two 0 up and then they scored and then they scored late on. Giza scored a worldy into the into the top right hand corner, but then I was just thinking like my body was everyone was completely fucked basically, <laughs> um, and then it was just we just got to hang on, um, and then we'll take it we'll take it into penalties. And we, like I said, that's when the, the experience comes in and, and our older players come in. Like We had players like Sammy Igo. Oh, what a penalty yeah. Sammy Igo did. Exactly. Uh, the, the, unbelievable. Um, and we had really, really good technical players. Um, so all I, all I had in my head was save one, we win the game. Save one, we win the game. And it's pretty much what happened. I think I, I, saved, I saved one and then... We end up winning that when Sammy Argo scores the, the winning goal, I think. Well, yeah, exactly. I think it was that save that really won it. Because after he made the save, just looking at all the Hemel players, after they started taking him, they all looked a bit nervous. And then when Sammy Igo took up, he just looked like a man in form. It was already like he knew he was already going to oh, score beforehand. It, it, was, it was never missing in a million years. The guy's a jug. Silly oh, no. bit. What a penalty it was. He just rocketed it into the top corner. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> and I think all the emotions and I think all the celebrations and then core that night was messy. I tell you that now was it, it topped the last one. Well, really, it was bigger and better. Oh my god, it was <laughs> chaos. Absolute chaos. Well, I think it was chaos as soon as it really finished because I was watching the pitch invasion afterwards. That must have been a nice moment going over to your family, seeing all of them straight after the game and having all the fans come and greet you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it was really good. Obviously, memories that I'll never, ever forget. Well, did you feel as though that moment you kind of started, it almost felt as though this was like, it couldn't get any better almost? Yeah, for sure. Obviously, promotion at alien level, you're on top of the world. It's a great achievement. Uh, They do say playoffs, winning the playoff is, is 100 times better than winning the league. I've never won the league. I've only ever gone up through the playoffs. And it is literally... One of the best feelings ever in, in football. It's it beats anything. 
Well, it's safe to say, I don't think this following season was too bad either, was it? Getting to the FA Trophy final. But before we talk about the final, I do want to talk a bit about the semi-finals because they weren't too bad either, were they? The <laughs> yeah, Battle was... of Hampshire. Can you just tell us a bit about those two legs? Yeah, for sure. Obviously, I remember, listen- I remember listening to it on um, Talk Sport Radio, the the draw. And for some reason, I knew we were going to get... I knew it was just <laughs> obvious. It was so obvious that we were going to get Haven't. Um and to be fair, it's good that we did play each other in, in the in the semi final because it had a nice little bonus to it. Home and away leg, um, two Hampshire clubs, two clubs that didn't get on at all. Players didn't get players didn't get on with each other from other clubs and stuff. So yeah, it was it made the game a little bit tasty. I tell you. Well, especially for you as well, being a former haven't player, did you kind of have a little fire in your belly and you just knew you wanted to make sure you got a result against your former team? Um, yeah, for sure. Like, I think there was a few players that on our on our side um, that used to play for Haven't as well, and obviously um, they used to always. It was just it was just a long, long thing. Like they used to think we were unprofessional and. Uh, go out on a night before a game which which we didn't obviously a few lads were a lot of finish work and have a few beers but it was just so like it was just peaks and troughs it was like yin and yang sort of thing like they did they just we just didn't mix at all like they had one philosophy we had another philosophy um and obviously it will come it will come collision on the semi in the semi-final well, the best thing about it was as well, I think, was the attendance. Not only winning, but the attendance was brilliant. Finishing the second leg at Privet Park. Because looking back now, I think it must have been one of the most packed out Privet Parks we've ever seen. So it oh, must have been brilliant to yeah. play in front of those fans as well. Yeah, it was really good. Yeah, honestly, it was it's the most packed I've ever seen Privet Park. And I think there were so many fans. I think the game got delayed 15 minutes. So, um yeah, so it, it was it was a great atmosphere, let's put it that way. And obviously, how it ended was even better. Well, knowing the fact you were going to get to Wembley, like, how was this? Knowing you're going to be playing somewhere that only the greats can play. Not every player can say they've played at Wembley, can they? No, no, for sure. No, obviously, especially um, at our level that we play at as well, it's, it's definitely something that's uh, few and far between. So it, it's a great... It's a great moment. It's an honour to play to play at the Hello Turf as such. So, yeah, it's just a shame that results the result didn't go our way, and, and I've not played there since. So, like I, 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 when I remember remember saying to myself when there was like five or ten minutes ago, and I said I, I need to play here again. I want to play here again. I will play here again before the end of my career. So I'm still <laughs> trying to chase that. <laughs> Well, hopefully you do get there, because even though, like you said, you did lost, it must have still been amazing memories. Can you just remember walking out at Wembley? <clears throat> yeah, it was a very, very surreal um, feeling, mate. To be honest, it's it's one of the one of the, the greatest footballing grounds in the world. Uh, like you said, very limited players um, have played at at this this special ground. Um, so it was a mixture of everything. Like you want to focus on the game, and obviously, but you also want to take it in as well. So. Yeah, it was a bit of a mixed emotions. Well, unfortunately, I think it wasn't too long after this where you actually left Gosport and joined Ebbsfleet. So looking back now, before we do move on to Ebbsfleet, what was your favourite Gosport memory looking back? Oh, I don't know, mate. There were so many. There's there's, there's ridiculous amount of many, many that I, I can't really say. But um, yeah, there's there's loads, mate. I, I don't think I can pick pick a few. I, I just think the the whole experience of the whole journey as one is is special mate and it will never leave my memory well it's safe to say you'll always be renowned for a gosport legend and like i said it was time for you to leave gospel but what was it that actually made you want to join the ebbs fleet because i think you've got quite a few offers from different clubs like your phone was constantly buzzing i think you said in one article yeah yeah for sure like it was it was only it was only ebbs fleet ever um it was no other team at the time it was um, Ebbsfleet. I remember, I remember playing Bath City away on a Tuesday night, and I and I played really well that game as well. And Ebbsfleet were playing Gosport on the following Saturday, so obviously oh, they, so they had their scouts watching the game, and I played really well that game. I think we won one nil, um, and they battered us. They absolutely battered us, but we won one nil or two nil. I can't really remember the score. And I remember someone contacting me on the coach on the way home saying that they're interested 
kind of didn't think nothing of it. I thought it was just a bit of like, oh, okay, um, like normal stuff. Uh, but then the next morning, it came to fruition that things were moving. And I spoke to a few a few players, uh, senior players at the time, spoke to Poey, spoke to Sam Pierce, spoke to Adam Wilde, like what their thoughts and stuff. And they gave us some really good advice, um, especially Poey. Um, and yeah, and my phone, I went to work that day. My phone was literally nonstop, like throughout we're making calls, this, 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 and that, that, that. Um, and it, the, the deal finally went through late on in late on in the afternoon and yeah the next day I, I travelled up and I was an absolute player and then played against Gosport on the following Saturday. Oh really? Must have been yeah. funny playing against Gosport then. Yeah it was yeah it was quite weird but we got the three points. <laughs> 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 no, but I think the biggest well no, perhaps not the biggest, but at least one of the biggest drawing points about Ebsfleet was getting the pro contract again because I think this meant you could actually leave your job at Nando's just to solely focus on football again so this must have been a massive positive joining their fleet. Yeah for sure I think it was one of those things I couldn't turn down um, and obviously I spoke to Pikey the gaffer at the time and it, he wasn't going to stand in my way because he knew the opportunity was there and he knew knew that's what I wanted um, but yeah for sure being full being full time it you can't beat it, mate. And obviously, I, I didn't really want to work at Nando's anymore. Yeah. <laughs> well, to be fair, I went to Nando's last week and the chicken was brilliant. But yeah, <laughs> but I do love a good Nando's. Yeah, don't everyone. <laughs> no, but it was pretty good at Ed's Fleet, all apart from one moment. And I don't really want to speak about this, but I think it is important about your career and just how you addressed it really afterwards. But during one game, I think it was actually against Boreham Wood, ironically, you did get a bit of racially abused and you actually went into the crowd to go and confront the fans. And this caused a lot of public outrage. I think the Sun did a, I think they might have done an article about it, the Sun. But really, what was it that spurred you on during this occasion? Because usually you were really good at handling racially yeah, motivated. Uh, it was just a combination of a few things, mate. Um, I don't really want to talk about because obviously I, I play for Bournemouth and stuff, and it's all been it's all been dealt with and and and, and stuff like that. But like I said, I was I was going through a bad time at the time and stuff off the pitch, um, and that was probably more the reason why I'd done it as well. And obviously, I just I had enough of people just saying stuff to me. So it wasn't the, it wasn't the first time that people said stuff to me in a game, mate. Like I said, I'm normally good, but just feeling things. That, wasn't right in, uh, upstairs so that's that's pretty much what happened but like I said uh, a few years later I'll come back to Bournemouth and yeah it's been great. Well I think it was after the incident you actually did quite a bit of PR work so I think you did a bit for Sky and a bit for PT and I was watching the interviews and they were really powerful like you talking about racism and your experiences involving racism but it's such a big problem within football and how do you actually exclude such a big problem like that? Uh, cool. Yeah, that's a good question, mate. I don't think you can exclude it, mate, because it's something that always will be there, um, especially because everyone keeps talking about it and people are not getting educated enough and there isn't enough bigger sanctions for, for when it does happen. Obviously, they're trying the hardest, but yeah, they, it, it's just one of those things. It's never, ever going to stop. So I just think, I think you've just got to try and not react to it, try not to... Um, not punish the people they have to be punished and very very severe punishment as well and the club should be punished and then you might see a drop in it but social media is a very very big thing it's very powerful as well so while there's social media mate it's going to get even worse yeah well yeah it's one of the sad things about football and the fact <coughs> well the good thing is kind of you did return back to Bournemouth and you actually did realize the fans were brilliant like looking at the fans from a neutral point of view they seem really nice people like I was watching them on Twitter and you're always giving them high fives always doing autographs so did this kind of just outline to you it's not the majority it's only the minority oh of course mate I knew that anyway like there's always one idiot in the crowd isn't there that wants to make a a stupid remark but that's life mate like I said I've accepted it my whole career mate and my whole life so of course I'm not gonna hinder everyone else's experience coming to to a game and just because that one thing's happening I'm not going to go and do anything something that's going to stop other people join the game and me doing what I want to do anyway so yeah for sure like it's, it's been great um 
love the fans. The fans love me as well. So, yeah, it's been, it's all, it's been good. Well, it was another move up in your career, wasn't it, joining Borenwood? And did you feel as though at this moment it was just going to keep getting better and better almost? Um, yeah, for sure. Obviously, as a player, you always feel like things are going to get better and better. My time at Ebsley was... It was great. It was it was really good. We made the playoffs. We won the playoffs. Um, we missed out on the playoffs. Uh, we won a penny shootout in one of the playoffs, which was amazing. Um, but I, it kind of ended very sourly um, due to a particular person at the cl- at the club at the time. And um, yeah, and I decided to yeah, it was time for me to leave the club. Um, the fans were great. I had really good time there, apart from apart from the last probably six months um, that I didn't really didn't really enjoy. But apart from that, it was it was a great club. Really enjoyed my time there. Played well there. Loved it. And then an opportunity come for me to play for Bournemouth, which I'm glad and thankful that the gaffer gave me an opportunity to play. Well, like you said, I think it was Luke Garrard who's currently in charge of Borenwood, and he definitely made the right call bringing you in because I think you've got two back. No, this season you actually got Player of the Season for the National League, didn't you? So this must have been quite a monumental award winning this. Yeah, for sure. Like, obviously, yeah, it's, it's it's good winning individual accolades like this, but it don't mean anything, mate. Especially when you don't go up or win or win the title or go up through the playoffs, which is very 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 um hard pill to swallow when that doesn't happen but yeah for sure it's a, it's a great accolade to have but it's not really something that I go out every season I want to do this like I want as players we want to go up we want we want to win trophies we want we want to win promotion that's that's the key and that's that's the motivation for everyone yeah, well, exactly that. But during your time at Bournemouth, you've actually gone on to make some quite big saves. And we were speaking a bit off air about one of them in particular. And one of them came against Southend. I'll put a clip on there for you guys watching at home. But your save against Southend, how good was that? Like, how do you pull off a one-hand save? <laughs> no, not a clue, mate, to be honest. But I'll put it down to really, really good weather. And it's, the ball stuck to me gloves. So, um, yeah, that, I, I don't know. I don't know how it happened. We were under pressure massively. Like I said off air, um, we went down to nine men. I think we had two players sent off, um, so we were under cosh massively. And um, they they come at us like a house on fire. And I think I think it was from a corner. I think or a cross. And the guys volleyed it. And I thought I thought when it left his foot, my first initial thought that's going wide. And then as I've moved and I've died, I think oh my god, that's going in. So I kind of thought, right, I can't let, I can't see this out. I'm gonna to have to catch it. So it was kind of like a late decision for me to even catch it. So then I just thought, oh, I can only go one hand now. I can't get two hands on there, so I have to go one hand, and just caught it, and it literally just stuck like glue on my gloves. So and then managed to land on it without spilling it as well, which was cool. Good bonus. <laughs> well, to be fair, watching the video back, it was just really satisfying to watch as like a yeah, view. Yeah, to be fair, it is, it's pretty satisfying. I've watched it a few times. Like, How's that even happened? How? But yeah, it was, I, I think it's because the strike was so good as well. It just makes it all look unbelievable. But yeah, it's very satisfying. Well, another one of your viral moments was for not such a great goalkeeper moment. Because I think this goalkeeper moment actually got you into a Specsavers advert. So oh, I think it was yeah. against your advert. <laughs> so what the hell happened yeah. here as well? Yeah, I, I'm, blaming the, I'm blaming the groundsmen <laughs> for the lines because they play chasing right <laughs> in the ground, don't they? So yeah, and, and the funny the funny thing is as well, I the goalie coach is left is left now, but at the time I remember warming up and I was like, these lines are gonna fuck kill me today. I know that. <laughs> so it was in my head subconsciously already before the game, and we were both pissing and laughing like, surely you won't do that. Surely you can't do that. And honestly, the maddest thing, I literally I don't know how it even happened, but I it's because of, I've ran out jogged back as in the ball's coming towards me think oh and i've just literally seen a corner of my eye i've just seen a line i've, I've not seen how bright it is or how uh, dim it is whatever how should I, um if i can I literally just see a line in the corner of my eye and i thought i'm in my box because you don't see any other lines on the pitch except football lines yeah, exactly so I, yeah that, i knew where i was so i just saw a line i thought <laughs> i'm in my box so i just picked it up and i've turned around i was like <laughs> 
I'm out of my box. <laughs> well, pretty much as soon as you caught it as well, you immediately dropped it as soon as the whistle yeah. was blown as well. L- l- luckily, the striker was behind our defender and the, the referee was really good that day because he was like... Um, yeah, he knew the rules. Normally, I, I was very surprised that he knew the, the rules properly, like fair play to him, because everyone was like, it's a sending off, it's a sending off. But it, technically, it's not a sending off because he knew it was a genuine mistake and the striker was never, ever going to get the ball because our defender was in front of him. So it was the right outcome. It was it was a free kick and that was it. And he see it was a genuine mistake and he knew that, which was fair play to the ref on that day. Well, it's definitely something to always have in your CV. If you ever wanted to go into acting, you can put that on your CV, being in a spec savers advert. But yeah, speaking I, of... I don't think I'm going to go far in that, mate. Don't worry about that. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, but speaking along the lines of acting, actually quite a famous actor did watch one of your games. And I think you might know who I'm speaking about because Mr. Deadpool and Ryan Reynolds himself came to, I think he watched the Boreham Woods versus Wrexham game. I'm not sure if you've seen the clip, but basically I think it was BT Sports streaming the game and there's a clip. So you come in and you actually save the ball and then it cuts to a scene of Ryan Reynolds watching the game. So have you seen Ryan Reynolds? Did you see No, him no, mate, no. I, no, 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 no. I don't think no, I don't think anyone sees him unless you play for Wrexham. So um, yeah, obviously it's, it's, it's amazing things what he's done there and stuff and he coming to, to watch to watch games at our level and obviously they had a project there and, and it's and it's worked unbelievably well for him so no it's not something i really think about or because it, it's not it's nothing really going to affect us mate so if he comes to the game great we get to play in front of some famous people but it's not really something that is, is on the top of my mind to be honest well, like I said earlier, you your time at Boreham Wood has been pretty exceptional and you've done brilliant work at Boreham Wood. And like I said, you're still fairly young. I think you're early 30s, aren't you? So where does your future actually now lie in football? Thank you for calling me very young. I'm very experienced and old <laughs> keeper now, mate. I'm, I'm 34 in February. So, yeah, oh, that's sure. still young. I, I, I like to um, I like to keep going as, as long as possible, mate, as long as I stay fit and um, and, and still want to play and, and still playing well. So for sure, I don't know where I don't know where I where I'll be. I'm still contracted to to Boreham Wood, so who knows? I don't, I don't really know. But could you maybe see yourself becoming a f- like coach one day, manager, or maybe a goalkeeping coach at this level? Uh, yeah, something I like to I like to think I'll be a goalie coach at this level. I don't think I'll be a manager. There's far too much stress, far too many. Uh, decisions and yeah, there's no way I could I could manage 22 players and keep everyone happy. It'd be carnage. <laughs> oh no, I can see you being a manager. <laughs> Maybe with a bit of FIFA experience. You never yeah, know. Like, what you to do. be fair, mate, I'm good at football manager, but that's about as good as I'm, I'm going to get. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, to be fair, I can't even do football manager. I tried it with Gosport this season and I think I got them relegated to, I think I got them relegated two leagues below. So, yeah, it's best to say I think I'll stick to the journalism with it. Yeah, football. nice. Well played. But, yeah, I've got a couple final questions just to round yep. off this podcast. And I think this is quite a big one. What is your favourite memory, just looking back in, like, the whole of your career? Oh, like I said just a minute ago, mate, I don't know. You've put me on the spot there. I've got... <laughs> There's so there's so many different ones, mate. Um, yeah, there's oh. so many different ones. Like, obviously, play playing. Uh, I can only go by all the teams I've played at. So I've got memories from different teams. So playing your first game at every every level, which is a big one. Um, playing my first game when I was only core oh, fifteen, sixteen at the time for United Services. That was a really really big day for me because they welcomed me and stuff they knew I was younger and and it felt like I knew all the knew all the lads my whole life sort of thing so that was a really good memory uh gospel memory I, I there's so many we we got two promotions played at played at Wembley um but I think apart from them three I think it's got to be the semi-final beating your arch rivals to, to get to Wembley which was a, <clears throat> a very very special moment um well- well, like you said there, pretty much the whole of your career has just been phenomenal, hasn't it? Yeah, for sure. Like I've, I've, I've enjoyed every single, every single moment of it and I want to keep going and stuff. So hopefully can have plenty more memories. But the biggest, the biggest target is to play in the Football League, mate. That's, that's one of my biggest targets. And it's still, still one of my 
um, my goals in, in life is to play in the Football League. Well, it's definitely achievable if you're staying the playing level you're staying at. But also, we've had quite a few young fans actually request some tips really from you about goalkeeping. So could you give some of our young fans just some tips on how to be a great goalkeeper? <laughs> Put me on the spot again. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> some um, hard questions. If it, if it was that easy, mate, then I think everyone would be a keeper. But yeah, yeah. Um, I, the only thing I can say is... It, is literally just just be dedicated to your work. Um, always listen to advice that anyone gives you. Or always try and work and, and just work hard. Um, and yeah, and and just make sure you're enjoying football and try and if you've got a chance to play football, play football. Don't try and and, and go the the long route of staying on the bench and waiting waiting for things to happen because it's not going to happen only you can make things happen in football so i just go by my advice and just just go out and play games if you have to go out on loan go out on loan but yeah well there's some tips from the great nathan ashmore <laughs> and also <laughs> i've got a, well i've got two more final questions i think this one you might actually really struggle with if you thought the other questions were hard this one might be a tad bit harder because i've had a lot of fans request me from this and i think if i didn't ask you this i'd be axed as a gospel media man so i've got oh, to no. ask <laughs> is there any chance we could see you back at privet park as a gospel player <laughs> what are these questions, man? Uh, I had to do it. I had to do it. A bit of age of Macintosh going on. Who knows, mate? No one knows in football. You, you never say never. Like, obviously, I said I'm contracted at Boreham Wood. Um, I, I still have aspirations of playing in the Football League. Um, but you never know, mate. You can never say never. Well, if you don't come back as a player, you can always come back and help with the media team one time. Maybe have a go <laughs> <play> with us. <laughs> maybe have a go at commentating because I think Justin yeah. wanted to have a go. So maybe I could have you two on the mic with me. Yeah, like, that could sure. be quite cool. But to round, <laughs> to round off the podcast, can we just can you just say the final words up the borough? It's quite a nice way to end it, and I think all the fans want to hear you say it for one last yeah, time. No up the borough. <laughs> well, final words from me: up the borough. <laughs> <laughs> Well, mate.